You're listening to the Economics and Country Risk Podcast from S&P Global Market Intelligence. In each episode, our experts will provide you with the where, how, and when to make decisions that transform your business. Hi, I'm Kristen Hallam, Content Strategist at S&P Global Market Intelligence, and your host for this episode of the Economics and Country Risk Podcast. As the demand for oil defined geopolitics in the 20th century, the scramble to secure minerals critical for the energy transition will likely shape geopolitics in the 21st century. Countries around the world are developing strategies around minerals like copper and lithium that they consider critical to their economies and their national security. Here with me to discuss these strategies and their potential geopolitical impacts are Carla Selman, Head of Latin America Country Risk, Theo Achimpong, Senior Analyst, Country Risk for Sub-Saharan Africa, and Hannah Katsion, Senior Analyst, Asia Pacific Country Risk, all of whom are with S&P Global Market Intelligence. Let's start by talking about the general view of increased global demand for critical minerals and provide our listeners with some examples of these minerals and what they're used for. Carla, could we start with you? Hello, everyone. Yes, if we are going to advance towards net zero in 2050, we are going to need a lot of infrastructure. We're going to need to expand our power grids. We're going to need transmission lines, batteries, turbines. And for all of that, we are going to require minerals. We are going to require copper, lithium, nickel, cobalt, their earths. So we are going to see a major increase in demands on these minerals required for energy transition. And here I would like to reference the copper study that S&P Global published last year that concludes that the demand for copper will double by 2035 from 25 million metric tons to 50 million metric tons. And from then on, it will continue to increase. So just to put it into perspective, the amount of copper required between 2022 and 2050 is more than all the copper consumed in the world between 1900 and 2021. So this study looks at different scenarios, and even in the most optimistic scenario, the result is the same. There's not going to be enough copper, and we are likely to see a similar trend for other minerals like lithium and cobalt. Those are some big numbers that you shared with us there, Carla. Theo, anything to add there? Uh, yes. So just like Carla was saying, for us to meet the new energy world that we're going into, then you would need far more of these critical minerals. Basically, they are fundamental to the fourth industrial revolution and then the global decarbonization agenda. You need them, like Carla said, for your high-tech industries, your renewable energy and even in some defense applications as well. But what makes them sometimes critical in a sense really comes down to the supply chain vulnerabilities and in the sense that they may be concentrated in a few geographic locations in addition to the normal market or price risks. Carla, you mentioned copper and shared with us pretty amazing figures about the surging demand for copper. Latin America has a lot of copper and a lot of lithium as well. And specifically, Chile and Peru are the first and second largest copper producers. So together they produce around 40% of the global copper output. And apart from that, they still have largest reserves. So there's likely to be even um, more mineral, there's to be even more potential, but the, they will face the challenges to take this mineral off the ground and into the factories because that is the problem. The problem is not that there's not enough minerals on earth for energy transition. The problem is that they are still underground and it takes a long time to take them out. And for example, in Chile and Peru, we are seeing different regulatory, political and security challenges. 
Chile, for example, which is the largest copper producer in the world and has always been business friendly, is now in the process of rewriting its constitution. And this new constitution is likely to increase the role of the state in the economy. So this generates a lot of uncertainty for investors. But we think that the new draft is unlikely to be too radical. So we think that private investment will continue to be allowed in the mining sector, although with higher environmental scrutiny and higher taxes. And also what we are seeing, for example, in Peru, now there's a political crisis with a lot of anti-government protests, including in the mining corridor. In any case, protests in Peru in the mining corridor are quite frequent with or without this crisis, and these are likely to disrupt supply chain of copper, which is also a big challenge for operating there. And in terms of lithium, Latin America actually has 60% of the global reserves of lithium, particularly in Bolivia, Argentina, Chile and Mexico. But only two countries are producing at industrial levels, and these are Chile and Argentina. So there's still a lot of uncertainty in those countries because the lithium sector is actually quite in early stages and the governments are just starting to define their frameworks. And we have that Chile and Mexico already, they class lithium as a strategic mineral and they are in the process of setting up a national lithium company. So there is likely to be increased state interventionism in the sector. Wow, lots of moving parts there, lots to watch. Theo, what does the picture look like in sub-Saharan Africa? What are the key critical minerals that are in focus there right now? Yeah, so in sub-Saharan Africa, a number of the countries, in fact, at the last check, almost every country has some form of these critical mineral or the other. So very much, Carla was saying, it's not really a question of the resources, but how you turn them into reserves by getting it out of the ground. But some of the countries really do stand out in that sense. So if we take copper as an example, then we're really talking about the Democratic Republic of Congo and Zambia. In Zambia's case, Zambia is the sit largest producer of copper in the world. When we take the DRC, where it produces over 70% of the world's cobalt, which is used in making all these battery parts and components. And again, Zambia is also the second largest producer of cobalt on the continent. But in addition to that, there are new resources in the form of lithium as well, that have been discovered in a number of countries in the continent. So the countries, yes, do have these resources, but it's actually one thing turning them into commercial reserves and producing them. Thanks for that. Some common threads here. Hanno, what about in the Asia Pacific region? What are the critical minerals that are in focus there? Well, countries like Australia and Indonesia, they're already major suppliers of mineral commodities, and they're seeking to capitalize on this rush for critical minerals access. They're boosting output for these minerals. Indonesia has large reserves of nickel. Australia has nearly half of the global share of mine production for lithium. So these are countries that already have established extractive industries, but the challenge here will be to develop downstream capabilities involving the processing and refining of these critical minerals. And when we think of APAC, the push to secure stable supplies of critical minerals is driven not only by energy transition needs, but also by policies that are aimed at growing advanced manufacturing capabilities. And this includes developing clean energy industries like electric vehicle battery manufacturing. So this is playing a part in the national corporate strategies of Japan, South Korea, Indonesia, as well as Australia. And it's also coming up as a focus area for coordination in multilateral forums, like in the Quad, for example. They passed the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which includes, amongst other things, numerous incentives to drive the energy transition. And we can see some of the strategies around critical minerals in there. So I'd like to hear more about what the political response has been in some of the countries in the regions you cover to that Inflation Reduction Act and the strategy as the U.S. is pursuing that. So the response in the APAC region hasn't been homogenous. We have countries like 
Japan and South Korea, they have voiced their concern for the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act on their auto industries. Now, the financial incentives in the act, like the tax credits, they're limited to vehicles classified as domestic and made in North America. So this excludes Japanese and Korean car makers. And then on the flip side, we have Australia, where the reaction to the to the Inflation Reduction Act has been on what this means for Australia's mining industry. Mining is Australia's single largest industry by share of national GDP and was responsible for 14.6% of GDP in 2022. So as a free trade agreement partner of the US, Australia has preferred status under the Inflation Reduction Act. So it's very positive for Australia's critical mineral strategy. And this is a strategy that aims to position Australia at the center of this growing demand for critical minerals. And like the Inflation Reduction Act, it seeks to build a more resilient supply chain for critical minerals. So we're seeing some very good alignment here between these two strategies. In practice, the Inflation Reduction Act will facilitate investment partnerships and processing and sourcing deals between the US and Australian entities. And this will be seen throughout the value chain for critical minerals. Theo, how about in sub-Saharan Africa? Has there been any political response there to the Inflation Reduction Act? Yes, there there has been some um, response across the board. The only real sort of bottleneck is the fact that the U.S. and some of the European nations are playing a bit of a catch-up game here. And what I mean by that is that several of the mining and the processing infrastructure for these critical minerals are often owned by Chinese or Chinese affluent concerns on the continent in, in that regard. But there are, of course, some attempts to shift the balance from the U.S. perspective with the Inflation Reduction Act and what is happening on the continent. I will give you two examples here to highlight that. Last month, uh, there was the biggest ever mining conference on the continent called Mining in Daba. Uh, it's held in Cape Town, South Africa every year. And at Mining in Daba, we had the largest ever U.S. delegation to date. And these were people from the White House and the Department of State and Commerce and Energy. But also earlier in the year, in January, we actually had the United States signing an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, with the Democratic Republic of Congo and Zambia. And what they want to really do is to strengthen the vehicle battery chain. So they want to help these countries to not only mine the resources, but very much like what Hannah was saying, move around building battery components and assembly lines, but also respecting some of the ESG, environmental and social governance regimes. So we see a bit of that already happening or taking shape on the continent. The big issue really now, I think really is to what extent, if any, the U.S. through the IRA and some of these other strategic initiatives would be able to dislodge the companies that are largely Chinese-owned that are operating within the value chain on the continent. So let's talk about that. There is an access question here, not just for the U.S., but as you mentioned, for mainland China, for the EU, and It's going to be interesting to see these geopolitical relationships evolve in the context of the energy transition. What are we expecting on that front, Hannah? Australia, Chile, they have a lot of these critical mineral reserves. China dominates in terms of processing these minerals. It has a near monopoly in rare earths refining, for example. So If we're taking the Australian example, Australia, yes, it's seeking to develop its downstream processing industry. There's a lot of investment going into that, but it will take years for it to to surpass the supply provided by China right now. And so this access question will factor into how countries like Australia manages relations with China and vice versa, as China will need to compete with the US and the EU to maintain access to critical mineral deposits overseas for its own downstream processing sector. 
And this will be taken into consideration on both sides, Australia regarding relations of China, China regarding its own foreign relations policy. To add Theo or Carla? Yeah, I think that's really what Hannah was saying is really at the core here in terms of the the strategic response in the sense that the, the Chinese have been ramping up these processing capacity, you may argue, probably over the last 15, 20 or so years, and it's giving them a first mover advantage in some of the refining and the value chains. And then we're seeing the reaction to that by the U.S., but also even in the EU with the Green Deal and the new Critical Raw Materials Act that they're seeking to pass. It will take some time before you begin to see that date into some sort of gains in terms of market share. But for a lot of the countries in Africa that I cover, the preoccupation is really about how they can participate in this value chain and ensure that there's also the technology transfer and the development of industrial capacity, all underpinned by a wider industrial policy drive. That's where many of the countries are coming from. Makes a lot of sense. Carla? In most of the countries, if not all of the countries in Latin America, the US and China are the main trading partners with the EU coming third in many cases. So I don't think that they will discriminate against investors coming from one side or another. But what we have seen so far is that China has been ahead of the game and has been predominant in the lithium sector particularly. And they are very much involved in some countries such as Argentina and also getting into Bolivia. But we are likely to see more interest from other countries. So in the past months, we have seen missions from South Korea, We've seen missions from India, from Germany, all of these countries exploring how to enter the sector as well. So in our discussion, we've identified some risks that companies who are involved in the critical mineral supply chain would need to consider, would need to navigate, ranging from increased government interventionism, ESG considerations, the potential risk of protests. Are, what, if any other signposts, should they be looking for? What other risks should they be mindful of? So apart from the regulatory uncertainty that we are likely to face in several countries, we still see that countries like Chile and Peru have an overall friendly business framework, and this is likely to stay this way. But they are more likely to face other challenges, particularly when it comes to environmental issues and social concerns. Any company seen as, for example, causing environmental damage or not conducting prior consultation properly with local communities, they not only will face reputational risks, but they are also likely to see their access to finance limited because financial institutions are applying and are expanding their exclusion criteria. So in Latin America, we see that they are very strong environmental and anti-extractive activism. So we are likely to see disruptive protests and also court challenges that are likely to delay or cause suspensions of projects or cancellations. So we're going to see that governments and companies will have to try to communicate very effectively that energy transition is not possible without mining and they will have to find a way to promote sustainable mining while also respecting local communities and their lands and resources. Right. It's it's quite the tall order there. Theo? Yes, in Africa, we do have also these community issues, but they're definitely not on the scale in terms of the organization of these groups or the protests as we see in Latin America. Most of the issues are really more on the bigger end of the scale or the macro end of the scale, where because a lot of the governments are actively pursuing this based industrialization as part of a wider industrial development strategy, we're seeing states wanting to have a bit more take of the pie. So they're using tax instruments and non-tax means to increase their vision. There are also other issues really more around the the state of the infrastructure itself, 
that allows these mineral resources to be extracted. So, for example, city provision, the road and the rail network, which in many instances are not fully developed. And so we require new forms of investment to be able to get these resources onto the, the market. But the issues are largely macro in nature around the tax and the regulatory issues in Africa. Hannah? These political, operational, security, reputational risks that Carla and Theo described in their regions, I think take, looking at Australia again, this only helps to strengthen Australia's position as an attractive alternative supplier. Australia has strong and transparent government institutions, doesn't face the protests and community risks that Carla especially was describing for Latin America. The legal and financial system is robust in Australia. There's established mining technological expertise, overall low operational risks, so all that makes it a very stable investment destination. And also to meet increasing demand from commercial entities for ESG standards across the supply chain. Already Australian federal and state and territory governments, they're already developing ESG certification specifically for the critical mineral sector. But in terms of commercial risks, because of the strategic importance of expanding the critical minerals industry, the Labour government is very likely to increase federal control over the critical mineral sector. And this means greater foreign investment scrutiny, added regulation probably, but in, I don't think it will necessarily slow down this push for cooperation on critical minerals between Australia and partners like the US, for example. Let's go to what we sometimes call the lightning round here and share with our listeners the top takeaways from our conversation today. And Carla, I'll start with you. Yes, I think that governments in Latin America are just starting to realize all the resources that they have and how important they will be for energy transition. And I think that they are likely to now start discussing new frameworks which are likely to include a little bit more of state interventionism, higher taxes and environmental standards. Thanks. And Theo? Yeah, I think the geopolitics will play quite a big role in all of the reorganization of these supply chains. And in that regard, the likes of the US and the EU will try to also use their development agencies to help de-risk a few of the projects that they want to, to get into. Secondly, I think really the ESG issues would be quite pertinent and increasingly even become more so at the project level. But lastly, to support the point that Carla just made, in Africa, a lot of the governments want a bigger part of the pie. It's not just a question of extracting the resource, but they would want more value addition in country, and they would want their mining companies and other state-owned enterprises to play a part of that game. All right. And Hannah? I really have my eye on the downstream sector, so processing and refining critical minerals, developing downstream assembly capabilities for the purposes of clean energy transition. This will all be key in the Asia-Pacific region. However, it's probably worth differentiating a bit between minerals here. So while Australia is already developing lithium refining capacity, it's unlikely we will see development at the same pace for processing rare earths on Australian shores. The environmental cost of processing rare earths is quite high. We're going to see some discrepancy between the pace we're seeing for rare earths processing for cobalt processing for lithium. So I think it'll be an interesting area to watch. Great. Thank you to Carla, Theo and Hannah for sharing their insights with us. Please join us for next week's episode as we continue to delve into the forces shaping the economic and geopolitical landscape in 2023. Thank you for listening to the Economics and Country Risk podcast. Connect with us on LinkedIn and Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode.